I'm really excited to be here. My name is Ryan Rose. I am the Chief of Staff for the Cisco Developer Relations team. I'm joined by Matt Bolick, um, a member of our IOTBU. Um, uh, Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So, uh, Matt Bolick, as you said, I am currently the Director of Technical Marketing for the Internet of Things group, the Industrial IoT group. Uh, at Cisco. I've uh, been around the technical marketing group for a long time and for folks that aren't familiar with technical marketing, it's an interesting combination of engineering, sales, product management, we kind of touch a lot of different things. Um, I've been in technical marketing at Cisco for 26 years. Uh, that is basically my entire background, my entire story. I started as an intern in a TME group at Cisco and so I've been in a lot of different areas, a lot of different groups, a lot of different technologies and finally wound up in the coolest place in the entire company which is the IoT group. Okay, so IoT, for those who know me, it has a very special place in my heart. Right. And it's because I think IoT is like a gateway to everything that's developer. Mm -hmm. um, because we have so much that is already IoT at our homes. Mm -hmm. So whenever someone comes to me and says, um, I want to get into development, I want to start getting into coding, like where do I start? Um, I typically recommend, hey, do you have a programmable light bulb at home? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a, a, you know, a, a heating or air system that you can automate? Um, I love IoT technology because it makes a lot of what we do as developers very practical mm -hmm. and it brings it right into your home. Like, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, you have a very interesting view on what developers can do with IoT. Yeah, and, and you know what? You know, your, your, your standpoint is absolutely correct because, I mean, if you look, you know, if we're geeks, if we're in the developer community, we're all interested in doing things that we can show off to our wives and our children and yep. make lives, you know, super interesting. It's, it's great if you can get paid to do it, but it's, it's awesome if you can tinker around in your spare time and do something that's really tangible, you can see real results, that's real internet of things. I mean, that is that is basically what we're doing. Well, yeah, and I, I think what's also really cool is, is that it, again, it brings, IoT technologies really uh, bring that like software and code to everything and anything. And what's awesome is in the DevNet zone right now, it's just over the side right here, we actually have a really great example of Cisco IoT technologies and something that a lot of people were surprised to see. Mm -hmm. On our floor right now, we have an Indy autonomous vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it looks exactly like an Indy car, except there's no driver. Right. Uh, the, the cockpit is filled with Cisco technology. Right. And um, it has been wildly popular. We've had a lot of visitors. I mean, I, I feel like we've had to hold people back from uh, trying to climb uh, over on top of. Um, tons of pictures. Everybody yeah. loves this car. Um, uh, Matt, could you tell us a little bit about this car yeah. and kind of how did Cisco get involved in this? So it, it's really interesting because this is the Indy Autonomous Challenge. So mm -hmm. Indy Autonomous Challenge com for anyone that wants to look it up. This is a program that was started sort of like the DARPA automation autonomous yeah. challenge yeah. that was a yeah. few years ago where they, they had a bunch of government grants and grants from third parties and nonprofits to create a challenge to really drive the state of the art in uh, autonomous vehicles to the next level. The Indy Autonomous Challenge is exactly the same thing. It started about a year and a half ago um, and, and Cisco got brought in because um, they were designing kind of the prototype for this car. Mm -hmm. uh, Clemson University did the design for this. They have a really fantastic uh, automotion, auto automotive lab uh, down there. And they were looking for a way to actually connect all of these sensors and everything that was needed for an autonomous race car. Yes. Um, and they called us up. We're in, uh, a lot of us are in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, just a few hours north. Uh, so we, we flew down to help them out. We drove down to help them out, honestly. Uh, and we kind of work together to solve a lot of these problems. It, it is, uh, it's an interesting challenge because it is, um, it's a consortium of, of universities, really. So it's really open to any university that, that wants to participate. Uh, currently, there's nine teams, and they're made up of, I believe, about 15 universities from all over the world. Uh, and they're basically competing not to build the best autonomous race car on the world, because that's already been done. Mm -hmm. uh, they're building to write and code and develop the best autonomous software. Oh, um, man. So all of these cars, we basically have nine of those cars. We built the first one at Clemson University. Uh, we then replicated that nine times, actually 10 times. The 10th car is behind you. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, all of those cars are absolutely identical from a hardware perspective. There's Cisco hardware in there, absolutely. And there's uh, lots of really interesting hardware from third parties. Uh, there's there's the controls, those control 
uh, architecture that's needed to drive the car, all of the servos, the mm -hmm. low-level car control stuff to keep it safe, because yes. uh, you don't see Indy cars running without a driver very often. Uh, and then there's tons of sensors. The car is just loaded with sensors, really looking to put the best of the best that might possibly be out there for any sort of autonomous vehicle. Uh, there's uh, servers with lots of GPUs in there for running yes. the software that the students build. Uh, there are LIDARs, there are radars, there are uh, really highly accurate corrected GPSs that can get down to three inches. Uh, <laughs> there are six high definition cameras around it. I don't think I'm missing anything there. There's sensors galore on here. Uh, most of them are connected via Ethernet, so we have an industrial Ethernet switch, an IE5000, one of our switches. Yeah, I saw um, that. They, yeah. they had opened the vehicle, and where you would expect to see a steering wheel right. is an IE5000 switch. We didn't ask them to do that, but it was really kind of convenient that they put <laughs> the IE5000 right up at the top. Yeah. So as soon as you take the cover off, you see an IE5000 there. Um, with just gigabit Ethernet ports coming in, PoE going out to a lot of the sensors, uh, 40 gig um, gigabit Ethernet channel connection down to the server just to wow. process all of that data. Uh, and then to get off of the car to the control software, to the control systems, uh, we have a wireless link using our Cisco ultra-reliable wireless backhaul technology. Yes, so that's, that's right. That was, a fluid, that was an acquisition from a company called Fluid Mesh about two years ago, yep. um, which really is, is interesting and it's tailor-made for something like this because um, you take 802.11, normal Wi-Fi that everyone uses, um, and that's great in a multi-vendor, multi-access environment where you have lots of people kind of competing to use the network and yes. you have you know, really well-defined standardized mechanisms for uh, doing back off when there's congestion, for doing quality of service, for really working in a nice multi-vendor environment, so it just works. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that it, it kind of breaks down when you're trying to build a control system yeah. that relies on really low latency, reliable handoffs, and doing things very quickly in a, in a predictable manner. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where ultra-reliable wireless backhaul, formerly fluid mesh, really, really got its, got its, 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 its pride because um, they use 802.11 chipsets, it works just like Wi-Fi on a, in a spectrum standpoint, so it works everywhere Wi-Fi does. Yeah. It plays really nicely with other access points. Uh, but then if you have a curb radio on both ends, all the bets are off. We can go into really low latency mode. We can provide control connections for a race car doing 190 miles an hour around a racetrack. You and, know, you bring up the speed on yeah. this, and that's actually another thing that's like fascinating about this car. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Honestly, like when when we were able to partner our, right. our two teams, developer relations and IoT, to be able to bring this car here, I was super excited. Yeah. And everything I've learned about this car from the latency, that was my very first question. I was like, I wonder how they handle the latency issue. Um, but then to learn about actually how fast the car is. Yeah. Uh, now, I think you all just broke a record, if I'm right. I think they did. I believe they're a little over 192 miles per hour. In a oh land my speed gosh. record. They went down to the uh, shuttle landing strip in. Uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida, <laughs> and uh, they have some amazing video footage uh, of that, where basically they're just running the cars as fast as they can go in a straight line, wow. just to see how fast they can go. Um, and the interesting thing is that that curb technology um, really isn't breaking a sweat at these speeds, because it, it was it was actually designed and developed for providing you know really good latency control connections where where safety is a concern, and also where high-speed roaming is a concern. So it's used a lot in rail environments, high-speed trains. Oh, wow. 200 kilometers per hour is not unheard of. So a race car going 190 miles per hour, we can do that. Oh. Um, which sounds like bragging, and it probably is a little bit. <laughs> but that's, that's just the, the amazing things of these technologies. So it's, it's used at both ends of the spectrum when you've got really high-speed roaming, whether it's a train or a race car. Uh, and also used where controls are, are absolutely paramount, where you have safety as a concern, factory floors, AGV, autonomous guided vehicles, uh, autonomous mobile robots, AMRs, um, look very, very similar from a design perspective to an Indy race car that's right driving autonomously. Oh, uh, and I feel like this has been uh, one of the reasons why our two teams partner so often is mm -hmm. that um, what we are often trying to do at DevNet is find that bridge between hardware and software yeah. and really help people that are on both sides of that equation or working in the middle sometimes right. of that equation. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's so, like, I, we have the Indy Autonomous Race Car here, obviously, but we also have a robot arm API mm -hmm. challenge. Uh, we have uh, our Dev Dash challenge that also features IoT technologies. Yeah. Again, I feel like it is a gateway uh, if you are interested in becoming yeah. a developer. It's perfect, and, and I mean, it's, it is nice to show a flagship $800,000 race car, and if you're a college <laughs> student 
and your university is participating or they want to participate, they can absolutely you know, look into getting you know, into that. But there's only nine, 10 of these cars in the world, so that's not really approachable for everybody. Yeah. But there's lots of options out there, whether it's you know, autonomous challenges like this, there's uh, an open source F1 10th challenge that's sort of like the small cousin right. to the Indy Autonomous Challenge where they basically take a lot of the same software and some of the same sensors and scale it down to RC car size and have, race, you know, have competitions there. Oh, um, awesome. So there's lots of opportunities for developers to get in there to, uh, to try out things, you know, whether it's a race car or it's, you know, it's a robot arm or, or anything that DevNet has to offer. Uh, well, it's very approachable. Oh, no, and I will say, too, in addition to being able to ha host this car here, mm -hmm. our two teams together are also hosting a number of sandboxes. Speaking mm -hmm. of things that, you know, developers can start working with and getting their hands on now, yeah. um, uh, I'm really excited to hear about all of the news with IoT opportunities operations dashboard, mm -hmm. um, uh, the cyber vision. Uh, there are so much cool IoT technology here in the DevNet zone mm -hmm. at Cisco Live. Do you have any favorites, any recommendations to anybody watching at home? Well, it's it's hard to play favorites. It's like a parent, you know. I, you know, I, I both I'll tell both of my kids that they're my favorites until one, <laughs> until they ask me together. Um, but honestly, all of the stuff that we have in both in DevNet and in D Cloud, just to give them some some props as well. Oh yeah, uh, is is phenomenal because it, it gets our technology, it gets our capability out in the hands of uh, as many people as as can possibly see it and can kick the tires, can try things out. Uh, certainly, IoT Operations Dashboard is our management portal for all things operations technology. It really yep. is touching everything within our portfolio, and it is sort of the, the single pane of glass that you go to. So I guess if I had to pick a favorite, it would be things, I would say IoT Operations Dashboard, but that's really a cage, <laughs> because that really also ties into ultra-reliable wireless yes, backhaul. That to also say. ties into uh, our routing products. It ties into a lot of other things that we do in IoT, so that's not really a fair answer, but it's probably the best one I can give. It's a good um, umbrella answer. Yeah, it's a good umbrella answer. And I will say too, like in our sandbox, mm. I think we even have a number of uh, IoT hardware pieces. We so we have yeah. like, uh, not just in that sandbox, but in others, we have like an IR1101, mm. we have a IE3400, um, we have a, um, a number of different pieces of technology that yeah. people can get hands on with today. So yeah. it's, I, been, it's been great for us, not just from a developer's perspective, because it's, it's great. You can go to DevNet, you can get into a sandbox, box with a real piece of IR1101 hardware. You yep. can write your own software, you can run against the APIs, you can do all of that. But it's also great because it gives customers and other folks that don't have access to the physical hardware a chance to check it out. Exactly. Um, just to see that, hey, is this real? Yeah. How, do I, how do I configure you know, QoS? How do I configure you know, NetFlow? How do I configure all of these APIs and different things on the box? Uh -huh. well, we'll give you access to one remotely through DevNet. Again, it's that bridge on mm -hmm. all sides of that equation, the hardware, the software, and the people that are traveling between the two. Yeah. Well, Matt, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you again for your partnership and bringing this car here. Yeah. It's like, again, uh, the fastest thing at Cisco Live US. And <laughs> uh, again, super excited to, to have yeah. you here with us. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for joining. And thank you so much, Ryan. And you know, the partnership with DevNet, is, it goes both ways because it, it's really a phenomenal one for us as well. Um, because like we said in the very beginning, you know, the ability to, you know, to bridge that hardware and software gap, and especially in the Internet of Things world, which is where we live, um, that is tantamount to everything that we do. So, I, I mean, our partnership with DevNet is, uh, is absolutely essential to what we do, to getting that message out, um, because not everything that we do is an $800,000, $190 mile per hour race car. A lot of the stuff we do is, is stuff for everyone. So exactly. uh, thank you very much for this partnership and for bringing us into your booth today. Oh, no, happy yeah. to have you. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, to everybody back uh, watching us uh, virtually, you can uh, always check out all of our IoT uh, developer offerings at developer.cisco.com slash IoT. And of course, you can find everything that we're doing here at Cisco Live and everything that we've done at Cisco Live at developer.cisco.com. Uh, developer uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. From Matt and Ryan, 